Hi, I'm Kenny Yates. Welcome to Hold the Hope. And it's that time of year again. It's Christmas time. The season to be jolly. The season for giving. It's the season for giving because God first gave to us. So today we're starting a brand new Christmas series entitled, Tis the Season. And this first message is entitled, Christmas is given. So turn with me, please, to Matthew chapter 1, verse 18 through 23. Now, the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. I want you to notice that the angel told Joseph that the child that was conceived in her, conceived in Mary, was from the Holy Spirit and not by the Holy Spirit. There was no actual sexual contact there. As in Greek mythology, when the gods came down and procreated with human women and produced offspring and had children by them. Jesus always was and Jesus will always be. He existed as the word of God from eternity past. So when Mary was found to be with child, the word, that word of God became flesh. He became a human being, as John's gospel declared, in order to fulfill Isaiah's prophecy, which is found in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. Now, Isaiah further cries out in his writings, Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6 through 7, he says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David, upon his kingdom, to order it and to establish it with judgment, with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Therefore, Christmas is all about giving. For a child was born, but a son was given. God gave us an eternal Christmas present that very first Christmas day. And this Indeed, it's the gift that keeps on giving. Christmas is the time of year that is most known for giving. Even though we should be given throughout all the year long, Christmas is well known for giving. Christmas is a generous time of the year with angel trees, shoe boxes, feeding the homeless, Christmas dinners, Christmas parties, Christmas bonuses, Christmas presents. Christmas is a time of giving. Our first point is this. We are to give first to God. I want us to look at what Paul wrote to the Corinthians about the Philippians in his second letter. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 3 through 5. For they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means of their own accord, begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the, in the relief of the saints. And this, not as we expected, but they gave themselves 
first to the Lord and then by the will of God to us. They gave first to God. They gave first to the Lord, then to the brothers who were in need. We are to honor God first with our tithes and with our offerings. Do not succumb to that propaganda of the enemy telling you that all the church is interested in is your money. That is not our primary focus. Our primary focus is souls. Proverbs chapter 11 verse 30 says, And he that winneth souls is wise. So if you didn't know, now you know. We give all, all of our time, but well not all of our time, but we give our time to, to, to the Lord. We give our time to praise and worship. We give our time in devotional time. We, we sit down. We have a quiet time. We, we have a time of prayer where we commune with the Lord God Almighty. We get to know Him and He get to know us and that we might grow spiritually. I want you to think about this for a second. Are you in the same spiritual place in, in your Christian walk that you were, say, maybe last year or maybe last month, even last week? Are you in the same place or are you growing spiritually? Are you climbing one step higher every day? Or are the same things that tripped you up last week, last month, last year, are they still tripping you up today? Are you getting over those humps? Or do you still stumble over the same things that you've been stumbling over? When Jesus comes back, Will he know you? Will he know who you are? Or will his reward, because he's coming back with his rewards, will it be for you or will it be for somebody else? Our second point is family. Parents get so busy trying to give their children the world that they forget to be a part of their world. It's not about things. It's not about stuff. It's not about climbing the corporate ladder. And I'm not saying that these things are all wrong or, or bad in itself. I'm saying spending quality time is best. Look at what Jesus told Martha when she became distracted. Jesus was visiting his friends, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. And Mary was all busy serving and getting food ready and Mary was there, all googly eyes, sitting at the feet of Jesus and staring up with her mouth open and just soaking up every word that Jesus was saying. She was enthralled by Jesus' words. And Mary was getting, or, or Martha was getting overwhelmed with all the serving that she had to do. And she wanted Mary to come and help. So she went and she spoke with Jesus. She says, excuse me, Jesus. Do you not care that I'm stuck here doing all the work by myself? And my sister is just sitting on the floor doing nothing? Tell her to come and help me get the food ready for all of these people. The people are getting hungry. And there's still lots of food left to, to, to be made ready. You know, besides, I'm fixing a special dinner just for you, Jesus. So if you don't mind... Would you please tell Mary to come and give me a hand? Thank you very much. And this was Jesus' reply, Luke chapter 10, verse 41 and 42. He said, Martha, Martha, you're anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken away from her. It's not about things. It's not even about food and drink that, we, that is necessary for us to be alive. It's not about that. Remember that these days are evil. The times are hard. But there is one thing that is most important. That is salvation. For, for John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God gave us the most precious gift of all. He gave us salvation. He gave us eternal life. 
And if we want it, we can have it. All we have to do is to accept it. And it will not be taken away from us. Just like Mary chose the good portion and it was not taken away from her. Neither will our salvation be taken away from us. Now I don't want you to misunderstand what I just said. I did not say we could not give it up. I said it will not be taken away from us. They can ban Bibles in schools. They can outlaw prayer in government buildings. They can try to lock down churches. They may even try to prohibit praise and worship in our services, but they cannot take the free gift of salvation from us. Praise the Lord. Because no man can pluck us out of, his ha- out of his hand. Look at John chapter 10, verse 27 through 30. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish. And no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. There you have it, from Jesus' own mouth. No one can snatch us out of his hands. We are secure in his hands. All we have to do is to continue in obedience. Therefore, Christmas is the security that we have in Jesus. That no matter what they take from us, no matter if they try to confiscate our property, and I believe that that time is coming really soon when they will begin to take away our property if we do not conform to what they want us to conform to. Just to keep us compliant, they will begin to create laws that will confiscate our property. But even if that do happen, they cannot confiscate our salvation. We have security in Jesus. No one can take us or snatch us out of his hand. So no matter any of that stuff, No one, and that means absolutely no one, no government, no deep state, no one can can, can separate us from God. When we get all concerned about what's happening around us, when we get all concerned when the things are going, not the way that we think they should go, or not even the way that they ought to be going, And we think, what about these things? What about this? And Paul says in Romans chapter 8, verse 31 through 39, What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Jesus Christ is the one who died. More than that, who was raised? Who is at the right hand of God? Who indeed is interceding for us? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sakes we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to the slaughter. Now I want you to pay close attention to verse 37. It says, No, in all things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure, I am persuaded, fully persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. God is great and God is good. Therefore, nothing in all creation can take us, steal us, or confiscate our salvation. We have security in Jesus. Sometimes we get so caught up in the Christmas season with the Christmas programs, the Christmas lights, decorated into the Christmas tree, Christmas shopping, what to get mom, what to get dad, what to get the children, what to get the wife, what to get the husband, that we get so lost in the season. We get so busy chasing the Christmas spirit that we miss the real Christmas spirit. 
Sometimes we got to slow down, take time out, and commune with Jesus. Commune with our God. Our third point is community. At Christmas time, there are community outreaches to get involved in that will give you the opportunity to give back. I'm not talking about those ministries who are toting political correctness, causing division and hatred in the body of Christ. I'm talking about Christ-centered ministries. The body of Christ builds up, not tears down. The body of Christ unites, not divides. The body of Christ encourages, it does not discourage. Because we operate in love, and this is love. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does, it does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always preserves. Love never fails. That, my friend, is the definition of love. That is the epitome of love. Just because a ministry is organized under the banner of Christianity and has been a good and loyal servant up to the point when a new leader takes over and now embraces the world and its decisive or divisive tactics, neither, whether they, they, they knowingly do it or do it in ignorance, it's time to let them go. Christmas is a time for helping those in our community. It's a time to bring together, not separate. We help those who are in need. Churches are filled with those who don't have enough. They barely make ends meet. Now I understand that there's scam artists out there. I understand that there are tricksters out there. I understand that there's somebody out there who's trying to get something for nothing. But my daughter, Ari, uh, shared a video with me just the other day. It was a mother explaining to her son that she could not afford a present, a toy, that she had promised him for getting straight A's. A father was in the store, and he overheard her explaining to her son that she, she could not afford this toy. What he did, without asking, he just pulled out his credit card, and he insisted on paying for the toy. Now, there were other people ahead of him that, that, that overheard the conversation. And, and they did not want to, to, to help because they thought it was a scam. But this man, when asked, he said, why? Why did you help? And did you not think that maybe it might be a scam? His answer was that even if I'm scammed nine out of ten times, if I could just help the one it's worth it. And I thought, wow, what a Christ-like attitude. What a Christian attitude to suffer the loss of being scammed nine times to help the one. And I thought about Jesus. He said he left the 99 to go find the one. The one is important. That one might have been you. That one might have been me. The one is important. And I thought, if we could all be like that, we'd suffer the loss, being scammed to, to, to win the one. The world would be a much, much better place. Thought about the homeless. There's an opportunity there to pack shoeboxes with goodies, with treats, and hand them out. Wrap them up. Like, and... and with Christmas wrappings and make it look like a Christmas present with candy and other goodies, toiletries, and hand them out to the homeless in your community. Get involved in ministries like Operation Christmas Child, similar ministries like that, that give Christmas presents to underprivileged children. My daughter, again, Ariane, shared this story about this child who said that she couldn't understand why a total stranger would want or would take the time to send her a Christmas present. 
Then she read the little note that they had inside. It said, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. For God so loved that he gave. And she understood the real meaning of Christmas. Jesus is the reason for the season. Christmas is about giving. Here's a good one. Be a mentor to one child. Statistics say that 55% of young adults with a mentor are less likely than their peers to skip a day of school. 78% are more likely to volunteer regularly. 90% are interested in becoming a mentor themselves. 130% are more likely to hold leadership positions. Mentoring provides a great opportunity to give back to your community. This Christmas, think about becoming a mentor. There are lots of single parents with children in your church. Find one. Be a mentor to one. Also, there's the elderly. Those who are homebound and cannot get out to church, who would love to go to the church but cannot. Stop by, visit, visit once a week, visit twice a month, or whatever your schedule. I know you're busy. I know time is short. I, I know about this stuff. There's a lot going on. But give a little of your time and give back. They would greatly appreciate it, I'm sure. What I'm saying is, let this Christmas be the catalyst to spark a life of giving. Let this Christmas be a time to reconnect. Even better, let this Christmas be a time of connecting to Jesus, if you haven't already. So, the question is, if you don't know Jesus, would you like to know Jesus? Would you like to know him as your Lord and your Savior. He offers the free Christmas gift of life. It only comes from Jesus. We cannot get eternal life anywhere else. And Jesus offers it free. You cannot buy it. You cannot steal it. You cannot trade for it. It's free. And Jesus offers it to you. He paid the price for you and for me on Calvary when he hung on the cross. When he died for those three days and then rose again on the third day. He offers salvation, the free gift of life. Would you like to know him as your personal savior? If you would like to receive that free gift, all you have to do is to ask. Say this prayer with me. Father, forgive me for I have sinned. This Christmas season... I accept the free gift of life that you offer. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. If you prayed that simple prayer, the Lord is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. You are now a child of God. What you need to do now is to find or buy a Bible or Get your Bible off the shelf and begin to read your Bible. Get a highlighter. Highlight the promises. Highlight those verses that are meaningful to you. That when you're tempted, you can say, It is written, thus saith the Lord. Then find yourself a Bible-believing church. Not one of those progressive churches, but one of those churches who believe that there's a way that is a right way and there's a wrong way. Walk in the right way. Find that church. Be discipled in that church. Be mentored in that church. And when Jesus comes back, he'll find you doing what it is you should be doing. And he will say, well done, my good and faithful servant. For when Jesus comes back, you want him to know who you are. He's coming back with his rewards. You want those rewards to be for you and not for somebody else. My name is Kenny Yates. This is Hold the Hope. And from our house to your house, Merry Christmas. 
Thank you so much for joining us. The Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. Be blessed and stay blessed.